Hello and welcome to the wonderful world of Innova, alive and composing with Yvonne Troxler's today's guest. Yvonne, what do you pronounce your name for the record? Yvonne. Yvonne Troxler. Oh, oh the, 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 the Troxler part of it had, it had a, a special kind of Swiss uh, ring to it. Uh, yeah. Is there an explanation for that? Well, I usually say Yvonne Troxler because that's how everybody says it here, but that's not, yeah. <laughs> okay, so just for the record, here is New York, and there, where your R came from, is Switzerland, is that right? Right, that's Switzerland. Okay, so you've got a very wide stance with one foot in each culture. How does that work out for you? How did that happen? This is amazing, it's great. It's like, I think it's one of the best things you can have, you know, being in both places a lot. And just picking the best <laughs> from both and, and putting it together. That's very nice. Okay, and p apart from Nutella and uh, whatever other common uh, cultural things there are between Switzerland and New York, what are the, uh, the, the best items of each that you brought with you to share with us? Best items. <laughs> not, 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 not items in a jar necessarily for spreading on toast, but uh, what, what right. do you like about each culture that you're so happy to be picky from? Yeah. Well, I mean, one thing I definitely, as a musician, I love the music culture in Europe very much. And I love the new music there, the way it's done, the way it's people compose. And of course, there is there is much more funding there and much more money, so it's it's often done on a very high level and, and very well done. So that's something I really like, and I want to keep that up definitely on a high level. And um, and contrary here, like everything seems like <clears throat> everybody seems to struggle a little bit, like money here and there and all that stuff. But everybody is so eager and open to do stuff. So it's people are very open. You, I'm sure you find people who are not, but <laughs> and mostly people are very open. So it's like it's much easier to try out stuff that might not be great or fail or something that might be really amazing. You can try it out. People will support you, or at least there is a feeling of like, yeah, try it out. Make it, make it happen. I mean, you guys are like that. Your 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 CD label is definitely something like that. You want to make something happen, and it's happening, and you're helping people, and you're doing a great thing. So that's very much America for me. <laughs> All right. Now, if you weren't making music as a career, what might you be doing instead? Oh my God, <laughs> I would be dead. <laughs> that, that's always an option. <laughs> no, I don't know. I guess I would be somewhere in the visual arts. Uh, as a person with a brush, or a, a choreographer, or, or someone who gives out grants to people? What, what ends of the visual arts? Oh, oh, as an artist. Okay, yeah. as a visual painter, yeah, graphic I mean, person. Right now I'm, I'm doing a lot of graphic design work, just on the side also sometimes to just um, save money but I love doing that and I guess I have a knack for it so that could have probably been another other way to, to go professionally. Now since both of these things come from the same brain uh, how what are the correspondences between the way you uh, process visual images and think about them and create as well as the way you perform on the piano, as well as the way you make beautiful musical compositions? Well, I think that that is a very, very important question because I think very much like a visually thinking person or I, I encounter music that way very much or I'm inspired that way when I write. Often it's some kind of image, you know, in the end you might not hear or see anything like that, but you always need, I always need a starting point and an image that really triggered something much more than sounds, maybe city sounds and that stuff is kind of intriguing to me, but often it's it's uh, some, some visual thing that, that made me, gave me a feeling and as a pianist, I'm, yeah, I have that thing a little bit too, it's much more probably into movement, feeling like 
if you could dance it, you can play it. So if you can move it, so it, it has a visual aspect that way, that way also. Which came first in your development? Were you a pianist who said, I can compose better pieces than that? Or were you a composer who said, ah, I better find out how to play these things? Um, no, I wasn't. I was a pianist very much. I'm still <laughs> very long. I became a composer very, very late in my life. It took actually to go to, to the United States to come here to open up that possibility for me. I didn't do that when I was in Europe. I was doing it when I was a child because everything is like open, you don't know, judge. But as soon as I went into conservatory and all these serious studies, I was just, I thought like, no, 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 you can't do that. This is too big a job. And I don't know. So when I came here, everything was possible again. So I could actually start composing, even if it was bad. I didn't mind, nobody cares. That's quite a freedom here for me. Like nobody cares, so you can actually do something. So that's how I started and started really loving it. And I think now there's not one day when I don't write something, some little thing, some little send to a friend, a little thingy, or I just do it. I'm not, I think I'm not very ambitious as a composer in a way that I want to become famous become famous or something, I just like doing it. It's just, it's a, almost a personal thing. <laughs> Yay for America, the land of opportunity and uh, the ability to, and to help you branch out. Um, so uh, tell me a little bit more about your early, early compositions and how they've evolved. Did, did you actually study with a teacher per se, or did you kind of absorb music around you and figure it out and, and, you, and it's kind of grown as part of your whole aesthetic? Well, the way how um, studies are done in Europe, you, you have a lot of theory and you have a lot of, you have to write compositions anyway, as everybody has to, as part of, of your theory um, program. And so uh, I was writing then and, and, and um, did think we could do it well, but I don't know, that was just no place in my mind to think that it could go further. But then later it started with the glass farm ensemble was the first kind of um, instrumentation we had that was like um, piano, electric guitar, saxophone and percussion and we played a lot of concert with that constellation but there's not much music for that round so at some point I just had to start writing some stuff for us so we have music, you can't always play the same pieces if you have concert series you know to bring some new music eventually. And then um, the first, what I did, I started arranging pieces that I really felt like strong, like had strong connections and felt like this is such a good mix, we should try and play that and it would make sense for these instruments. And I think that was part of my, my studies then because I, I started doing that a lot. Like for everything, I started arranging songs and I, I did the Mahler, the um, songs of Wayfarer, and I did big pieces, make them smaller, I made small pieces, make them bigger. I, and that way you definitely get to know a composition and a composer. And, um, that was definitely a big help. And then there was a, a former uh, teacher of mine, and a, a professor at the university, who I became um, very uh, close friends again and he was actually coaching me a little bit at the beginning steps of my composition tryouts so he would give me some feedback and, and um, I had many times when I said no I can't do that this is too hard you know I take a guess every note this is just it's 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 like it's horrible for me to do that he said just keep going keep going so he was very very important for me for that period in my life I think that's a very historical relationship between being a composer, a performer, and uh, you've extended that into the musicians around you with a particular ensemble. Uh, you know, everyone from Bach to you know, Palestrina to Harry Parch and Philip Glass have had their own ensembles and Zeitgeist and you know, the particular combinations of instruments around you, uh, you, you need repertoire. And so it's, a, it's kind of a natural evolution to, to start arranging things for it and then then one step further to creating original works. Is, is there anything that it still seems too daunting to you 
uh, that you wouldn't be able to uh, feel confident writing for yet? <laughs> the piano. <laughs> well, I I tried. I started something, but I feel like this is such a big instrument. You have to be really good. So I don't know. It's like maybe for all the people, it's the string quartet. For me, it's the piano. What's your first sound memory? Looking back, is there something that uh, uh, you remember your ears taking in as a baby uh, that uh, it, it will never leave you? I couldn't tell. I, uh, I have that story that I went with my parents to Barcelona where an aunt uh, got married and we went to that um, reception and, and party and they have this big orchestra playing and honestly I must have liked the music very much. I was two and a half or three years old and I did dance the whole time. I didn't stop, I didn't eat, I didn't drink, I didn't do anything. I was just dancing to that music and they saw like before I hit my head somewhere and they saw like something might have gained, gone slightly wrong with me because they a little worried about me dancing like for six hours straight but obviously that was like real musicians and real music and I couldn't stop like this. <laughs> you haven't stopped ever since <laughs> and would an outsider see any similarity between your personality traits and your music the, the way you are the way you talk the way you think the way you dress and move when we, because we're listening to your music right now, what, are the, what is the connection? What, what do you learn about yourself through doing music? Well, I kind of hesitate to, to connect um, the personal life with somebody's work. <clears throat> Honestly, I don't really know where, <clears throat> sorry, where that is coming from, you know, where in the end, what ends up being on the paper, what it is that I did, uh, of course, it's me writing it, but I, I don't think you can say, oh, that was a really sad day, and then, oh, finally, she got the sad song. I I don't see that so related. It might be that I'm interested in a lot of different things. I'm not a musician who only sits at home and practices with the metronome and tries to get as fast as possible or something like that. I'm much more interested in many different things, and yeah, you... You, you mentioned something, how I'm dressed, I'm, I'm colorful, I like to be <laughs> around fun stuff. And, uh, but I don't think, I mean, some of my pieces, I'm always aiming towards these really dark and, 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 and low instruments. And I'm intrigued about low instruments. And, but then I think like, if people see me from the outside, I think, oh, this is just somebody really happy and upbeat. And so, but then you go to low instruments and go like, that's kind of like uh, something else, you know. <laughs> I like ugly sounds, and I like, like, I don't know. I I wouldn't make that connection so easily. Yeah. It sounds like you just did perfectly. Uh, now you've got this wonderful CD. It's your actually second one on Innova, uh, but this one is all Truxler all the time, and this one's called Bruhaha. Can you tell us a little bit about Bruhaha and how it's uh, it, uh, how it is in the world, what, what thought went into it, and uh, a couple of highlights. Do you want to hear about Bruha, uh, about the CD, or about the piece Bruha? Well, give, give us a quick overview of the CD, and then dip into maybe one or two highlights as we listen. Okay. Okay. So on the CD, um, there are like like how many pieces? Well, there's one piece that's called Pen One, that is. Um, uh, a piece that I wrote <clears throat> being inspired by a big building in New York, Pen One it's called, that um, in a storm it started making these sounds and it started kind of like holy, like in a weird way. So that kind of started this a little bit. Then there is a, on the CD another piece that's called Shirgotti, that is a percussion trio and that's kind of spread out a little bit because I started one movement a long time ago and was actually asked for, for a percussionist to write that 
and then it became a very short piece. I'm a short pieces writer, so um, eventually I felt like, well, there need to be more pieces to that. Otherwise, I mean, you can't just have like all these instruments on stage and play for two minutes. So there were three more, and the title basically came during the process. Shrigadi is like the word for um, meteorites from Mars because that's. Uh, a little little village in India where uh, the materials from Mars first landed, so that's how they're called. And then the title piece, Bruja, is um, maybe a little homesick piece or something. It's a uh, it, it is inspired by a very old Swiss tradition in, in the old uh, uh, folk tradition music in Switzerland from the northeast part. Uh, where they have these um, clay bowls and they run a five franc piece, a little bit bigger than a quarter, on the side of the bowl. Like it, it doesn't, it's not flat. It runs like this. Anyway, so it makes a big sound, and there are these three men doing that um, together, and it creates an amazing sound. So I was intrigued about that and translated it eventually into something different, there are glass bowls and uh, ball bearings playing it, but in the end um, it has a little bit of that um, sound and Bruhaha, the title came because uh, when I first, I got the real bowls and I tried to do that thingy with the five franc piece, which looks very easy, but it's not so easy, and I tried and tried, I was sitting here for hours, eventually I had to get earplugs in my ears because it's so loud, it's just very noisy <laughs> when you throw that metal thingy in there and it makes a big noise. I even have the whole Buhaha party where I tried to basically as a um, secret audition if somebody could do it so I could get them to play it in a concert. But well, we played till two o'clock in the morning, very noisy, but nobody could do it. <laughs> anyway, so that's Buhaha, and then Sosaurus is uh, the next piece on the CD and um, that is one of these pieces for, for uh, kind of lower instruments and um, was a little bit inspired by a friend of mine she showed me once in Brand Central here in New York City she showed me that the murmuring corner or stone I forgot how it's called anyway there's that arch if you stand in one, one corner and say something very softly into the corner and behind you like uh, probably 15 feet away or more on the other corner the person looks also in the corner and they can hear you clearly and I was kind of intrigued about that because I mean Grand Central is a noisy place and people run and rush around you and you go and say and you can hear that over there in the other corner so I was intrigued about like these the noise and then suddenly you hear something clear in the in the environment of uh, loud noise. Yeah, that's Sosaurus. And then the last one is Kaleidoscope. That was recorded already previously and is on the first CD as well. This one is totally remastered. It's uh, I think better that way. And um, that one was uh, one of the pieces I wrote for this uh, instrumentation that I just mentioned before where we did find so many uh, pieces. Yeah, that's uh, the whole CD and, and also a little bit about Bruhaha and why. And there we have it. It's a wonderful second harvest or a beautiful crop from the glass farm itself. And uh, so thank you Ivan Troxler for talking with us today. <laughs> thank you very much.